Namaste to all of you. Before I officially introduce myself, I, me, the voice hosting this first ever episode, now 30 seconds long, called POSCOM Talk Prevention Science, should give something back to the listener. I figured it was for creative purposes and with the hope that listeners would at least gain something substantial to incorporate into their lives before turning me off to start the show with this following segment called The Interesting Piece of Knowledge for This Day. So here we go. Namaste to all. For example, namaste to you as I bow. What I am saying is hello, welcome, I see the light in you, and I honor this opportunity to be politically correct and I may have to check myself many times over as I attempt to be myself, ego and all, knowledgeable and professional. The truth is, I physically cannot see the light which is radiating out through all of you as I, you know, am here and you're there. We're in different physical realms. I'm here at the studio, Old Dominion University, and you're there now in the present, wherever you are listening. But I do truly believe that we are beautiful shining rays of light and while we may not be individual celestial stars ablaze in the origins of our universe, from my experience, we are fully capable of compassion, hope, empathy, acceptance, happiness, and love. And I think that's what makes us worthy of being among the stars. So, knowledge of the day. Namaste is actually two words. Nama, to adore, acknowledge, honor, or praise. And te, is you. The term you encompasses all of which we, me, and you truly are from and within this divine oneness. Okay, I'm going to say it. God, maybe, whatever. But please don't hate me. The God word can be a big deal. Namaste has been traced back to 700 BC. Philosopher Adai Shankara, who created Advaita Vedante with reflections of ancient Hindu scriptures, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Brahma Sutras. The Advaita Vedanta adopted the ancient Hindu spiritual way of life as non-duality, meaning spirituality and science live as one, working together as one. You're probably like, how do I know all this? If you're even probably like, you're probably like, whatever. But how do I know all this? First off, I don't know anything. I had to practice pronunciation. Upanishads and Advaita Vedanta. I've gathered this information from an acquaintance, and you know maybe he's even a friend of mine now. His name is Rick Archer, and he is the host of an excellent podcast called Buddha at the Gas Pump. Since 2009, Rick has had over 700 interviews with people one may consider spiritually awakening. Rick is also an author, expert in the Vedic studies and ancient scripture, and remains a practicing expert in meditation after teaching transcendental meditation for over 25 years. If you're a spiritual seeker or interested in interviews like Dr. Bernard Carr, who worked under Stephen Hawking, Kristen Kirk, Adya Shanti, the late Father Thomas Keating, and Julie Brown Yao, and hundreds more, please visit www.batgat.com. That's all one word. Or find Rick's podcast on YouTube and Spotify. Just type in Batgap. Who did the gas pump? You won't regret it. All right. So look, it's official. Poscom Talk Prevention Science just finished the first interesting piece of knowledge for this day segment. Hopefully you will know more about Namaste, its origins, and now Rick Archer's 2009 Buddha at the Gas Pump podcast. So a little bit about me before you take this journey with me. You may have to take this journey with me, but you don't have to. I identify as an American man. While my skin is white, my hair is brown, and my eyes are hazel, a little yellow, my ethnicity is Czechoslovakian, hence my last name, Piaka. I turned 41 years old on St. Patrick's Day, and I've been happily married for one, two, coming up on 14 years. Our son Judah is not quite two and a half years old, and his mom is scheduled to deliver his little brother, our second son, here in the middle of May. I am currently pursuing a Doctor of Social Science and Prevention Science at Wilmington University, that's Newcastle, Delaware. Those of you who have spent time near President Joe Biden's Delaware home probably know where Wilmington University is located. I get the luxury and honor of being an adjunct faculty member at Old Dominion University, where I finished my master's thesis in 2020 called Family Member Communication Patterns, 
during recovery maintenance, relapse prevention for alcoholics and addicts. This current project, POSCOM Talk Prevention Science, is part of the guided study coursework in the doctoral curriculum. At the end of the next eight weeks, I will be considered a doctoral candidate as I implement a research study to collect, analyze, and author a dissertation to be defended, edited, and published before May 2025 so I can walk across the stage at Wilmington's spring commencement ceremony. Again, welcome to Prevention Science POSCOM Talk. I am your host, Professor Piaka, but my students call me Professor P, and that will be my host name. For our first episode, we're going to go way, way, way back, beyond nostalgia, with the 1951 harm reduction, fear-based propaganda movie trailer of Drug Addiction. Gee, Duke, where'd you get him? I, uh, I know a guy. Three for a buck. Let me try. Gee, I I feel awful funny. Me too. I feel kind of (laughs) sick. Come on, Marty, pass it on. Marty got kind of sick, too, but he wouldn't let on. He was determined to be one of the gang if it killed him. And it almost did. Several weeks later, after smoking reefers, Marty's befogged brain hit on a clever way to open pop bottles. Later, Stan went to the hospital for swallowing broken glass. Marty badly cut the inside of his mouth, though he didn't even know it at the time. So, if you're unaware, the 1950s has been labeled the golden age of television. What we just listened to, Drug Addiction Part 1, was a 22-minute black-and-white educational film that is narrated by a gravely stern voice man who introduces and explains three drugs, H, or heroin, marijuana, reefer pot weed, and downers. That's it. There's no information on stimulants, like cigarettes, cocaine, or amphetamine, and no information on hallucinogens, though that would show up in the future fear-based prevention movies. Most importantly, there is no information on alcohol. Now, before we get into more about the lead character, Marty Malone, and other media-driven anti-drug interventions, let's focus on a few of the substances I just listed where no information was given. We will look at why and the truth about them. So, three specific drugs that did not qualify for educational purposes in the 1951 drug addiction movie were cigarettes, amphetamine, and alcohol. And no, this isn't a sad, bluesy country song. However, there was a pronounced blanket of social stigma hiding the truth about cigarettes and amphetamines and alcohol, right? I mean, look, let's immediately get to the cigarettes. And general knowledge aside, let's look at the truth. Also, please work with me, but I want to take the person who is suffering from schizophrenia out of the discussion because it has been widely researched and documented. Winter's 2010 research reports from Cambridge University have found that approximately 80% of persons with schizophrenia are heavy smokers. This is a positive effect. And self-medication of clinical symptoms and side effects of antipsychotic drugs appear to play a significant role. Okay, back to the truth. And let's go to Chang and Kankel, 2010. The World Health Organization, and of course our friends at Cambridge University, 1951. It is safe to estimate that 50% of the adult population smoke cigarettes. 1951, it is safe to estimate. I got, look, Chank and Kangle, 2010, World Health Organization, and Cambridge University. 1951, it is safe to estimate that 50% of the adult population smoke cigarettes. While the great minds of scientists you know, like the creators of the atomic, nuclear, and hydrogen bombs, may have had an inkling cigarette tobacco was poison, far too many other social and behavioral changes were needed in America at that time. However, let's fast forward 40 years later, 50 years later, 60, and now 70 years later. Goodness, the number of lives we may have saved just with something small in there, right? Something small about cigarettes. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't. But it wasn't a problem socially or judicially. So, 
1951's drug addiction is about Marty Malone, an excellent late adolescent taking on his rite of passage to fit in as he succumbs to the peer pressures of marijuana. And with one puff, Marty deteriorates into the bottomless rock pit. One scene features him hysterically oblivious, bleeding from his mouth after sharing a broken shard glass Pepsi bottle. At this point, the only thing left to do is heroin, and Marty does heroin. Before Marty dies, he gets into a rehabilitation center. So, look, it's post-World War II in America, and it brings two drugs together, marijuana and heroin. Pot, weed, or reefer is the gateway drug that is going to get you in trouble and take you down the road known as H or heroin. Now, simultaneously, another educational film that was meant for narcotics officers' eyes only was also released in 1951 called Subject Narcotics. Of course, the 21-minute film would get seen by the general public, and it is here where proper prevention begins. Regardless, however, of the misconceptions about all drugs and the disease concept of addiction adapted from Jelinek's 1950 alcoholism. The film was scary because, I mean, it was very graphic needles and outfits that would lead to the culmination of a group of individuals who began smoking marijuana and then ended up in a shooting gallery. The individuals in the film are using syringes, and it is a scary sight for the 1950s viewing audience. Remember, it has only been a decade since the introduction of big film media with sounds and colors. It is a fear campaign, and for good reason. (sighs) I'm about to go on a quick rant. And I do this throughout, but for those unaware of this shooting gallery terminology, that's a dope house. It's a drug haven. Today's generation may refer to it as a crack house or a trap house. Coming from an individual, me, who experienced the horrors of living in a trap house before the age of 20, I must confess that the shooting gallery in the 1951 educational film is very well maintained. And maybe it's the first trap house ever I mean, even the young lady of the gang has all of her clothes on, and from the looks of it, everyone is showered. My point is, the dope house, crack house, whatever it is, scary, sad, hellacious place. You might also expect to see a pregnant woman as well, and the horrors of the disease of addiction are not quite front and center here in this film. What does not go unnoticed to me, however, is the stigma about the individual shooting up heroin. They're demonized and corrupt. In fact, the person with an addiction is no longer human because in 1951, smoking marijuana and shooting up heroin meant the person's morals were gone. Now, this progression is an accurate portrayal of addiction, okay? But what is left out is that the individual is suffering and their identity is slowly dying along with their inner selves, their hopefulness and their dreams. The person with a drug addiction is not a bad person, but rather they're suffering from a bad disease. 70 years ago, society was just not ready to accept this reality. And look, there are still many today who are not ready to accept this, especially if they have been hurt by a loved one with the disease. All right, let me get back to this gateway thing. So let's stick with this gateway drug concept and stigma. Prior to the start of World War II in 1936, Reefer Madness was released on the big screen. Before we listen to the Reefer Madness trailer, I want to go back to the lack of speed amphetamine talk in 1951 drug ad, drug addiction. Excuse me. What we find out is that Dr. Charles Bradley, a psychiatrist in 1937, begins treating children with benzedrine for what he described as children with problems. Now, it's not until the late 50s and 60s that amphetamines will become more acceptable in the clinical field. I'm not even going to talk about one of the essentials, along with water and food, for a human to get the full-on life experience on Earth, and that is alcohol. It is a rite of passage, and it's ingrained so deep within the fabric of our DNA that who cares if it's there, right? But look, let's get back to the amphetamine. Let's digest some statistics from Tech Target article written by Schmidt in 2023. Adderall and generic brands of ADHD medication are now some of the most commonly prescribed drugs in the U.S., with more than 41.4 million prescriptions issued in 2022 alone. At the turn of the millennium, the prescription rate for ADHD medications was still relatively low at 
42.7 per 10,000 person. However, that rapidly increased in the preceding year, rising to 394.4 per 10,000 persons in 2015. Now, there's two factors that account for this increase. The proportion of children and adults diagnosed with ADHD rose, and doctors became more likely to use medications as a primary course of treatment for the disorder. Now, we're going to go ahead here and take a listen to the Reefer Madness trailer, 19th. These high school boys and girls are having a hop at the local soda fountain. Innocently, they dance. Innocent of a new and deadly menace lurking behind closed doors. Marijuana, the burning weed with its roots in hell. In this film, you will see the ease with which this vicious plant can be grown in your neighbor's yard, rolled into harmless-looking cigarettes, hidden in an innocent shoe, or watch case. In this startling film, you will see dopesters lure children to destruction. We're going over to Joe's place. Why don't you come along? We have a date to play a set of doubles. Oh, you can play any time. Come on, we'll have some laughs. Can I go along with you? Sure. Hey, I'll see you at dinner, sis. If you want a good smoke, try one of these. You will meet Bill, who once took pride in his strong will as he takes the first step toward enslavement. Of course, if you're afraid. Smoking the soul-destroying reefer, they find a moment's pleasure, but at a terrible price. Debauchery, violence, murder, suicide. the ultimate end of the marijuana addict. Play Hopeless insanity. See this important film now, before it is too late. All right. I'm inclined to suggest that Reefer Madness plays off the same gateway theory and social stigma utilized during the 1951 campaign that took Marty down that marijuana road to heroin. While heroin is scantily running around in this movie, the movie poster depicts the devil and over-sexualizes women who like the party as the gateway drug and marijuana as the moralizing finishing piece leading to suicide, murder, or insanity. And who knows, right? I mean, maybe covertly, this media campaign was also to prepare our nation's young adolescents men for military service. While the attacks on Pearl Harbor were a complete surprise, and the island had roughly an hour during the earliest part of the morning to even think about preparing, war had been imminent since the early 1930s, especially a generation removed from World War I. Stay away from promiscuous women who party, and don't smoke marijuana because you will surely go crazy. Now, shifting gears to what truly did or was imminent, that is, marijuana remains a highly debated risk factor in 2024, and heroin spawned into the deadliest epidemics faced by humanity. By the mid-1990s, the opioid epidemic and lethal fentanyl cataclysm, we've lost a lot of lives. First, marijuana. Elflin in 2023 compiled a list of the most used illicit drugs worldwide, including cannabis, opioids, and amphetamines. High estimates suggest that around 5.4% of the global population consumed cannabis in the past year, or excuse me, 2021, which that's probably gone up. All the billions of dollars wasted over, what, 80 years to control marijuana not to mention the life sentences for possession of marijuana from 1945 up to 2010 before the recent pardons by Obama, Trump, and the Biden administrations. Most concerning, and this is from Hall's 2020 Costs and Benefits Analysis article on the legalization of cannabis states that, and I quote, so far there has only been a small increase in adult cannabis use after legalization. But it would be unwise to assume that there will not be larger increases in the future. End quote. 
So why is this concerning? Well, if adults aren't increasing the usage, who is? In America, according to SAMHSA's 2022 National Survey on Drug Use and Health Data, 70.3 million people aged 12 or older, that's 25% of our population in America, used illicit drugs in the past year. Marijuana was the most used illicit drug, with 22% of people aged 12 or older, or 61.9 million people, using it in the past year. And this is not a declaration about marijuana prevention, harm reduction, or the war on drugs to be a failure. However, sometimes we need to stick with it. In the next decade, it will be, what, 100 years since reefer madness, and as though the strength and strains of THC are enhanced and accessibility increased, research may start to correlate the once outrageous 1936 claim that marijuana leads an individual to go crazy, murder, and even suicide. Unfortunately, the topic is so divided, conservative versus liberal, that statistical research proving THC's influence on the developing adolescent mind would mean I am either or. If I say marijuana can be looked at as violence, then I'm conservative. And if I say well, marijuana has been shown to help college students with PTSD, I am liberal. And maybe I'm both. Okay, no more weed. It was too strong nowadays anyway. Let's get back to the heroin. And, and please understand this about heroin. Analgesics, analgesics, and the inbred family of synthetic opioids. It has always been bad. No matter the opium wars of the late 19th and early 20th century, and maybe there was some global reprieve. The Harrison Act in America, 1914, which would make opiates illegal after World War I, followed by the League of Nations, 1920 to 1945, attempted the first worldwide war on drugs. But the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s, it was bad. I right, look. This is from the New York Times, September 13, 1986, Section 1 on page 1 of the National Edition. The headline reads, Growth in Heroin Use Ending as City Users Turn to Crack. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to go on one of these rants here again, and please excuse me. First off, the growth is still spreading, okay? It's just that the base is broadening, and I don't mean free base broadening, and pun is intended there. It means there are more options. In 1986, the New York Times claimed that there were over 500,000 heroin addicts in the United States, 200,000 of them in New York City. I'm here to tell you that those 200,000 heroin addicts are not refusers of other drugs. With the increase in treatment centers and medicated assistance, treatment addicts can burn out in the street and take homage to a program. Now, when I say program, I'm talking about the harm prevention methadone maintenance method, which, by the way, does get you high. I don't know who who says this, and they do. There's experts that say it doesn't get you. It gets you high. Ten milligrams of methadone, a ten milligram methadone pill or pink liquid, would nod me out for 24 hours. Throw benzodiazepines in there, and trust me, the only thing the addict remembers about using heroin. It's the phenomena of romancing, tying off, and injecting. And that's right. I said 10 milligrams of methadone would, would annihilate me for two days. Now, most clinics in the 1980s would give you the juice at about 30 milligrams, and then 35 milligrams, and then you're off and running until they let you plateau at 80 milligrams by the second week. And now withdrawal, let me tell you, withdrawal is hell. It's 100 times worse than the four-day violent heroin legs. Neither is deadly as alcohol, but methadone withdrawal is brutal. My subjective experience about methadone goes as follows. I began using hard drugs with my family, my mother and my sister, as a young boy. By the time I was 18 years old in 2001, methadone maintenance was more socially acceptable than admitting you need help and joining the 12-step fellowships. I'm being facetious. While on a methadone program, I always used the benzo or Valium, that central nervous system relaxer. When a client pops dirty on a urinalysis, the dosing down begins, and it is fast. On two occasions before my 20th birthday, I had started on a clinic and been forced to dose down. Withdrawal begins at about the 20 milligram dose, but by this point, most addicts, excuse me, people suffering from the disease of addiction, are using anything they can 
accept heroin because that would put the body into an instant withdrawal. Fast forward to day four without any methadone, and I haven't left my bed since that initial 20 milligram dose. I couldn't even move to go get the final two doses offered. This is both times. My sheets covered in sweat. I've been vomiting bile, and now the explosive up the back diarrhea begins. This is day four. My body hurts all over, so bad that my stepfather, who, like my mother and sister, died as a direct result of the disease of addiction, is downstairs. And, you know, he says, Hey, Addy, I got two bars of Xanax down here if you, if you want them, but you got to come downstairs and get them. Look, I'm 20 years old, just entering adulthood, 100 hours removed from methadone, and I'm suffering so badly that I can't even crawl downstairs to take enough Xanax to put me out of my misery for half of a day. And months later, you know, still a, a young, young adult, 20 years old, months later, nothing was ever the same. My bowel movements have not been normal since. I began using opiates in early adolescence. and Methadone withdrawal is still there. The sneezing, eyes watering, almost flu-like, mono sickness. And this is months later. In my opinion, it is a permanent withdrawal from methadone. Now, I'm grateful I was a young, young boy, young adult, you know, when I went through this, you know, when I went through this, my body was able to recover and I'm grateful for that today. But for those that are older and, you know, they don't get recovery and have to wait till later on in their life and they get on a maintenance program, you know, it's tough for their body to fully recover. All right. Please forgive me with the methadone maintenance rant. I promised myself I wasn't going to do it, but there's so many misconceptions about how it prolongs the lifespan of the opiate addict. However, sometimes being alive with untreated addiction is not living at all. While abstinence is and should always be the ultimate goal, I believe, for all treatment centers and recovery plans, I do side with harm reduction. I think that, you know, the medicated assistant treatment is great, but only when it's paired or even thrice with other methods, whether it be 12 step fellowship lifelong CBT, and other psychodynamic or holistic interventions. Let me focus. My main point here about the early social stigmas behind marijuana and heroin, at least in my experience, is largely true. I might suggest that cigarettes and alcohol are more of a gateway to drugs than marijuana, but then again, that may be subjective. It is safe to say that cigarettes and alcohol open the gate so that you can enter to watch the rocket blast off into outer space? In this example, marijuana would be the rocket. No matter what the gateway is, social stigmas about substances are important because the scarier and more looked down upon the drugs exist, the more we as professionals and interventionists must consider the state of being an individual must going through to do to use the drug. I mean, you have to be miserable, sad. Look, for an individual to wake up on this earth, to have to reach for a syringe, pipe, or pill, that has to be a testament to the pain that one is going through, or at least experienced in the past. And that's even in recovery, right? Especially if there's still maintenance, maintenance-assisted maintenance treatment, medicated-assisted treatment, right? There's pain. So I don't think it has anything to do with the individual being a bad person, though at some point, because of social stigmas, Laws that maintain a safe society and deteriorating state of physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being from the drugs, the individual will ultimately compromise and lose their inner morals until or and if recovery is ever possible. As far as marijuana, the hallucinogen, it is legal and far stronger than it was available entering the 21st century. Research is still limited. But habitual smoking males in adolescents up into their mid-30s appear to be in danger of serious psychopathological change. Maybe next time we can dive more into the harsh reality of what now is legal recreational cannabis smoking. And just go outside and take a walk or drive. I mean, you can't miss it. It's everywhere. Thanks for joining Professor Pete today. I hope that, you know, I wasn't too revolting with my loud mouth and opinions. My next scheduled episode will air in April, and we will have a guest, Dr. Tansy Vandekar Burden, and we will talk about public policy, social science research, you name it. For POSCOM Talk Prevention Science, 
Professor P, and I appreciate you for namasteing. But now, I'm namago.